Hello from me to all of you. Um, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to thank you for the invitation and I hope that I can contribute to the success of this online conference with some thoughts on uh, European politics. It is an honor to be here and I would like to thank everyone who has just logged on and just listening to our uh, talks here. Um, after the Croatian case study, I would like to turn back uh, a little bit to the big picture. And I'm very happy to have heard uh, the presentation of Ambassador Giormati uh, because I can really agree with a lot uh, he was explaining. I can continue to shed light uh, on the huge challenge of the liberal world order and why the French-German recovery plan is an unexpected uh, but huge step forward um, in uh, European politics. Um, as maybe you will know, uh, the importance of the Franco-German relations is uh, mostly known to all uh, in this circle of participants. Uh, in the past decades, after the Second uh, World War, these relations have always been characterized, uh, I think, by goodwill, cooperation, mutual understanding, and of course, an initiative for Europe. Um, if we look at the history of international relations, uh, this is by no means a matter of nature, especially not in the relation between France and Germany, which for centuries fought against each other in an eternal en enmity, as it was called. Um, in any case, uh, if we consult the most current theories of international relations, maybe we can better understand the background for this uh, development in international relations. On the part of the liberal ideal theory, uh, the cooperation of the states is always more successful and leads to stable peace conditions than an opposition or enmity. The liberal integration theory and the resulting uh, spillover concept helps us to understand why since the 50s, these two states have been cooperating more and more actively um, in more and more policy areas. And the modern theory of the democratic peace zones reinforces this view. It explains why the two states have always been more closely aligned and intertwined in their integration um, when the chancellor or presidents uh, were more deeper committed uh, to democratic values and open society and, as I stated here, uh, a strongly integrated economic relationship. Uh, this also helps us uh, with regard to the classical Marxist theory and Wallerstein's conception of economic world order. Um, regarding to these theories, the modern capitalist development of Germany and France is naturally looking for new sales markets and also cheap suppliers. Thus, a cooperation of the two countries in foreign trade areas and the worldwide advocacy of uh, the values of the free market economy is mostly understandable. And nowadays, uh, the mo one of the most common theories of international relations is constructivism, uh, which helps us to understand uh, the change of ideas of the elite, how after the Second World War, a completely new national construct was established mostly in Germany. Instead of the most important topics of former decades, um, among them, of course, the question of what is German and who is German, a European identity and a cosmopolitan view was put into the foreground, both of which nowadays, I think, cannot be separated from the self-image of the Germans. Um, in the international world, there is thus an expectation towards Germany that the country will always stand up for European values, for an open society, for inclusion and integration. And after all these thoughts, um, uh, the question remains how this relationship uh, can be evaluated on the part of realist theory. Here we can state that uh, at the center of the neorealist school of international relations, uh, as John Mearsheimer has formulated it accurately, um, I think is nothing other than power and might. And for Germany, the path to the classical understanding of defense, military power, influence, was clearly blocked after the Second World War. New ways uh, had to be found for a powerful self-defense and a more uh, powerful interest articulation. And this was participation in the Euro-Atlantic integration. The German um, uh, thoughts of uh, raison d'état were just put a step bigger to the European economic cooperation, to the NATO military cooperation. In addition, there was uh, the expansion of soft power and public diplomacy as new impulses of this same endeavor. Um, through these avenues, I think 
Germany has clearly been able to achieve what it was previously unable to secure through its aggressive military power, namely a leading role uh, in Europe with a clear hegemonic traits. However, this hegemony is always kept hidden in European context and always filled with contents together with France, which is a very special uh, thing for international relations. Um, and um, I think uh, this Franco-German tandem has been the unquestionable driver of integration for the last 70 years. Um, the historical reconciliation of the two countries, the cooperation launched by Konrad Adenauer and Charles de Gaulle, more and more joint steps around the LSA Treaty, the common foreign and security policy, and then ever deeper cooperation marked by Helmut Kohl and François Mitterrand clearly show us an unquestionable European leadership in a real politic sense. In this regard, history teaches us uh, that the cooperation laid the way for today's European order. But from the real political perspective, it is also clear that Germany and France have been clear winners of this situation. In every aspect of power and hegemony, the two states have shaped and guided European integration. Through cooperation, uh, the individual goals, such as wealth, military power, cultural leadership, could be strengthened. The saying goes, what Germany and France decide in Europe uh, will be followed and realized by Italy, by the Iberian and the Benelux states. The question is, of course, how long this will be valid. Here we can say uh, that the thesis can be taken for sure as long as the national interests are in harmony with the European interests and made, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I think, a gain of power uh, for uh, the respective states who are cooperating. Why is it important uh, to return again and again um, to this? This uh, realistic theory. For my part, I am convinced that only within the framework of realist theory, the motivations of international relations can fully unfold. We see that Francis Fukuyama clearly had to revise his thesis of the end of history. More and more states are turning their backs on classical liberal democracy and trying new ways of asserting their interests, as we heard in the presentation of Ambassador Yarmati. And even in the tradition-rich Western European states, signs of new criticism of the liberal world order are accumulating. Instead of cooperation and tolerance, self-initiative, self-defense, individual ways of solving problems are again coming to the forefront of the international agenda. Um, France and Germany are no exception for this. In both countries, internal political discourse is repeatedly overshadowed by these issues. And as Ambassador Yarmati told us, this is coming to the international sphere. Um, Kenneth Waltz, uh, and I stated he, this here in my presentation, Kenneth Waltz wrote in his well-known book, The Theory of International Politics, that the state's interest provides the spring of action. The necessities of policy arise from the unregulated competition of states. Calculation based on these necessities can discover the policies <clears throat> that will best serve a state's interests. Um, success is the ultimate test of policy, Kenneth Walt says. And success is defined as preserving and strengthening the state. Why can we choose this definition as a starting point? Um, if we examine the latest steps in Franco-German cooperation, we see clear national interests here for deepening individual areas of cooperation. Of fundamental importance last year, of course, is this COVID-19 pandemic. And here too, we can see the realistic thesis confirmed because we see here a global crisis with global economic consequences, but in the treatment of it, nothing else is expressed but the reaction of individual states. Um, that is why I would like to focus my presentation on an aspect of cooperation um, that has uh, also been at the center of discussion uh, on the future of Europe for uh, a long time. Um, certainly we are living in historic times and the frightening thing is that the analysts are really clear on this and it's not, not uh, because of the terrifying pandemic. 
Uh, we've seen, I think, similar terrible epidemics before, and I had the chance in a webinar uh, in uh, the spring to tell you about the historical uh, predecessors of this crisis today. Um, and this is not really new either, I think, what we are experiencing today. But all this together can lead to drastic consequences in our known European, or let's formulate, a larger liberal world order, which was created after the collapse of the bipolar regime, especially uh, because now we are facing a crisis in which it seems that the states themselves have largely initiated closure and isolation. And this is followed by unseen unemployment or the bankruptcy of commercial enterprises, as we just saw in the presentation of uh, Professor Lurins Niedit Benze, who just told us about the creation case. The spread of the virus has been global, but in its management, we barely find any traces of international cooperation. It has been handled entirely on the level of nation states. Overall, the response uh, of countries and governments around the world to the COVID-19 epidemic has been a major failure. And this has been primarily a failure of global governance. Nation states consider their own interests first and shape their foreign policies accordingly. Um, when we take a look back to the outbreak of the European pandemic, we can state the European Union was a real disappointment. It was divided both uh, externally and internally through democracy debates like Hungary and Poland. In addition, there was the weakening of the Franco-German axis. No clear leadership model for joint action could be seen uh, in earlier uh, this year. And the quick widespread of the pandemic took Europe by surprise, I think. Um, member states have shut down international airports on their own. They decided to introduce strict border controls, which is uh, unexpected uh, in uh, the case of U the EU. It's the first, the first time in the history that the EU external borders were closed. And it is uh, for 25 years back the first time uh, that the Schengen zone uh, uh, was interrupted in such a huge uh, case. Now, in the second wave of the European pandemics, it looks like we have learned nothing uh, from the spring. And the EU's image and popularity of the pro-federalist position are greatly undermined because there was no clear leadership. All this uh, is difficult to justify by the fact that the EU has no powers in the field of healthcare, and these steps can only be taken by the member countries. More importantly, under the unexpected pressure of the crisis, even Germany first had to clarify its own interests and lacked clear European leadership. This is why people don't identify with the super state. They need other identifications at local or national level. And there is still a lack of trust towards Brussels seen in this pandemic. And from Brussels, solidarity is still lacking between the member states. Many people just think that Brussels or the European Central Bank in Frankfurt is just looking at the bottom line and they just don't see behind the numbers. This is why possibly lockdown is aggravating uh, tension in civil society. There are numerous demonstrations against the strict rules, especially in Germany, and the European economy is threatened with losing its basis of prosperity. I think that the global political influence of the Brussels community has never been less than today through this pandemic situation. Um, and what we can see in economics is that uh, Europe had no answer. There was no new money that could be mobilized uh, to help countries. Uh, there was support, of course, uh, but only in economic criteria, even in the Eurozone, uh, to take another look at the budget and uh, just allow them to take loans from outside of the EU. And, um, the Franco-German leadership was only able to come up uh, with a new reconstruction plan only three or four months after the outbreak of the European crisis. And this was for months under criticism. Of course, the net contributors to the common budget did not want to co-finance uh, the southern member states and the indebted countries of Europe again after the 2008 uh, financial crisis. Uh, the, Ma the, the Macron plan or Macron proposal, as it is called, the Merkel and Macron plan, is now allowing the EU Commission to borrow on financial markets on behalf of the EU to fill a 750 billion euro reconstruction fund, which is seen as a temporary recovery instrument. The money would then be paid out as loans and non-repayable grants 
from the EU budget. And the aim of this so-called next generation EU plan is to mitigate the economic and social impact of the coronavirus pandemic and make European economic, uh, economic, uh, economies and, and uh, more societies uh, sustainable and resilient and to be better prepared for new challenges. Um, and as um, Ambassador Giarmati just pointed out, this is a very remarkable uh, new step forward because Germany and France had very different views on the economy during the last crisis of 2008. Germany was not only the guardian of uh, the European treaties, but also of the strong Euro with the transfer of German economic regulation to European levels. France, on the other hand, wanted to implement its model of intervening state, which repeatedly offered support and financing during crisis. Therefore, such a decision can be considered revolutionary. In this way, Europe can prove that solidarity is not just an empty concept. The idea behind this is that in the countries um, uh, standing together, uh, I think, um, they can borrow money on more favorable terms than many governments could do on their own. And the Franco-German proposal is a big step forward, starts as uh, Ambassador Yarmati said, a fiscal union, a truly functioning monetary and fiscal union, even in, if this reconstruction fund is only temporary. This new plan is a revolutionary scenario that can help overcome all the complete different economic philosophies of the states in the union. And again, as we take a realpolitik approach here, um, the difference between voluntary cooperation and obligatory alliance can be clearly seen now. Um, I think this is very involved in this new proposal. With the jointly implemented debt and financial aid coming from Brussels, the balance of power between European headquarters in Brussels and nation states is shifted towards Brussels. I believe that the European Commission is becoming more powerful and that is what counts for Chancellor Merkel. That is what has now led her to turn around in debt policy. The European Commission is now becoming an independent player on the capital market. The Brussels Commission is thus gradually taking on the form of a European government. Instead of voluntary technocratic union on finance, we are coming to a political union. This is in terms uh, of realism, nothing else than hegemony. And here we can still draw on a theory to help us again uh, from another viewpoint. A popular explanation in international relations, as I called uh, earlier, is the constructivist theory about images of self and others. And, what, and we, if we are looking at this theory, um, we see that uh, the refugee crisis of 2015 was an attempt in which Chancellor Merkel clearly wanted to reverse the historical image of Germans into their opposition. Instead of nationalism and the rejection of foreigners, a clear invitation we are us, we can do it, you remember, to all immigrants. And today, Chancellor Merkel wants to reverse the image of the uh, thrifty Germans, of Germans who uh, chastise other states economically and financially. The Germans are also doing their part. They will pay and will be probably the largest sum of money to cover the new Corona Recovery Fund. Um, I think this is the way to uh, uh, keep the lead together with France in Europe. Um, and this is the view of realistic theory again, um, who benefits from this all. And as we have seen in 2008, Germany's interests, Germany's financial elite is the most profiting from the Euro, is the most profiting from the European economic system. Uh, and if we continue to pursue this realpolitik and extend the consequences of the crisis, then this analysis has even more serious implications. I think the European Union, again, is the most consolidated regional organization in the world, but failed to take quick common steps. And this failure uh, is the failure of the liberal world order. This is why realist approach in international relations continues to deal with the structure of an anarchic international order where individual states and power politics are the most important actors. Nothing new in the world. Conflictual relations uh, will continue to dominate relations between global powers. And what does it mean uh, if I try to formulate some final conclusions? 
I think first and most important that this pandemic may not only bring about an unprecedented economic crisis, but also the biggest challenge of the European order or the liberal world order as we know it since the end of uh, the bipolar world. The virus has exposed global entities as either weak and politically compromised. It has restored or hardened borders, impeded migration, devolved power from the international to national and the national to local. So a period of lockdown and closed borders brings the end of liberal cosmopolitanism. This is why we have to think on the post-pandemic era, where a new post-liberal age can appear, where globalism may seem more like ghosts of an utopian past. This is why we can now look forward to new and very interesting debates on the future of Europe. Everyone will see their own views strengthened. Representatives of liberal institutionalism, socialist economic revolutionaries, sovereignists and nationalists, anti-globalist movements and localists all will produce their own interpretation of events. And this will create an even stronger polemic about the future world order. I believe building a post-coronavirus future will depend on a well-guided, critical and pragmatic correction of the liberal system. It would be a chance to build a better world, if we want to say big words, maybe with more virtue and morality in politics. And let's hope that the Franco-German leadership in the EU can grow up to this. Thank you very much for your kind attention.